Nane Nane. It was the eighth day of the eighth month and protesters had promised the eighth hour and the eighth minute. We are on the clock tonight with both protesters, police and Jimmy Wanjigi's house. And from shareholders to team of rivals, the evolution continues on Kenya's political landscape as President Ruto swears in his new cabinet. So what is next for the cabinet? We have 11 points. On some sense, does it even make sense to promise accountability in Kenya? On Kaikai's kicker, the June marking scheme for the president and the cabinet. And on my take, what a Bangladesh. Fellow Kenyans, we're not special. The news gang is here. Nane Nane will be able to birth a new nation and it is going to be our final day in the street. Tomorrow as we march towards a new republic. Yes. Nane Nane. Kabla ya sa nane na lakika nane. I want to assure you that the spirit of the Kenyan youth remains unbowed. Viva Comrades Viva. And uh, what a day of protests it has been. Um, what a day, actually. Uh, you know, two uh, major events taking place um, here in the country. We will also be taking a look, as we have promised you, at what's happening at Jimmy Wanjiki's house in Mathaiga. Uh, Gatete Njoroge is there. Um, there is um, police surrounding his home. Uh, we will be giving you the details. He spoke earlier with Sam Gituku. We'll get back to that in a moment. But this was the day that was promised. Um, maybe, Linus, to start with you, what, what's your assessment of, of what the day uh, has been like based on what was promised? And I think just the sort of history of the last two months. Well, it's um, another day of protests. Remember, this has, uh, has been the tradition since June, the 18th of June, where protesters have been setting aside Tuesday and Thursday as days of expressing their displeasure with uh, a government. And uh, they have styled their protests as pro-good government uh, protests, uh, which is basically to call for, among other things, accountability within uh, the government. And you know the hashtag uh, that the, uh, Ruto must go has been well into its second month now. Mm -hmm. But this is the first day the protests uh, were called under what we should call a new political arrangement where President William Ruto has just constituted his cabinet and actually gotten it sworn in. Uh, and it's a cabinet that is calling broad-based because it includes um, uh, members from the, from, from the opposition. What did we see today? We saw two things. The first thing is the protests did not really take place today compared to uh, other times because what the police did was to make sure there are no gatherings. Um, we saw the lockdown of Nairobi. We saw the closing of all the entrance ent uh, en entry points mm -hmm. to Nairobi. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you're talking about Thika Road, uh, the Nakuru Nairobi Highway, the Mombasa Road, all major points of entry to the city were uh, manned by police to make sure there are no gatherings. This could be a strategic uh, direction on the part of the police to make sure that protesters don't get together because when they do, and in the numbers they did, uh, say on June 25th, mm. then it becomes a challenge to control where they can uh, go next. So the lockdown uh, uh, in police terms must be considered very successful because uh, protesters could not access uh, the city center. But now we had a press conference not long ago at mm -hmm. around 6 p.m. this evening with the police giving their report on, on the, day. the day's events. Yeah. And, you know, the point they were making, and, and that is uh, the deputy uh, IG, who is also the acting inspector general of police right now, uh, Masengeli, saying that the police respect Article 37 of the Constitution, mm. and that is the right of people to pick it, yeah. to uh, assemble uh, mm. peaceably. Uh, you know, the irony is they didn't allow that to happen today. Mm. There was no gathering, there was no assembly. Mm. Uh, because every time protesters got together, 
whether in small groups, uh, especially completely, yeah, they, immediately, they were immediately yeah. uh, dispersed. Uh, so we have a different interpretation of Article 37 uh, if uh, the police uh, celebration of Article 37 is to be taken seriously. Yeah, uh, and uh, indeed that's what the day has looked like. And uh, in terms of the protests, really, uh, in as much as you know, they closed off uh, access to the city, but businesses obviously did not function. Uh, there were no public, uh, passenger service vehicles that were allowed into the city. That meant even people who had any business within the CBD could not conduct that. People who had businesses, shops to run and open, um, essentially, uh, Sam didn't get uh, to ply their trade today. Right. It was, it was interesting to listen to Adam Bungay, the police boss in Nairobi, saying that they are not necessarily stopping people, but they are controlling who gets, they are regulating who gets access into the city. It is fascinating that he would say that because how else are people supposed to go about their businesses? There's a, a lady who said that she was uh, uh, moving towards Kilimani. She could not get past Kangemi. Um, so I don't know that she walked, but also we, are, we were getting reports of several um, people that had to walk into the CBD, never mind that uh, businesses, again, as you say, uh, were closed. Uh, but then, so you're wondering, uh, so there's freedom of expression, there's the right to uh, protest Together, or yeah. to demonstrate, there's a freedom of media uh, that is covered at, uh, under Article 35 of the Constitution, but what we saw today, um, you're just wondering, is there freedom of suppression? Because that appears to have been the strategy used, and it's okay, maybe the police through the operational notes um, have a way of controlling how many people can get into the city, uh, probably in the name of protecting property and lives. But at the same time, how about journalists who are just going about their businesses, they're going, going about their work? We have seen several images of journalists that were uh, injured in the line of duty. Some of them were tear gassed, including uh, Stephen Leto and his crew. So you're wondering, so who is the target here? Yeah, because the journalists are just there to capture the events, to record what is, what is going on, to report, because we owe it to the country um, in terms of informing them of what is happening. Uh, so when it comes to police strategy, it appears to have worked, because if those were the notes, uh, including the statements that we had, uh, is it yesterday, but also the past few days that we've been hearing from the police um, uh, service, it has been uh, saying they are uh, armed uh, infiltrators mm -hmm. or goons that want to disrupt the peaceful protest that would be. We didn't see the goons today. Um, and w what is interesting is that when they say prior to the day that they've got intelligence that, uh, you know, there's infiltration, uh, we hardly ever see them then arrest the people. They say these are the people we suspected of uh, having a different agenda from those who want to protest and, and make their voices heard on whatever agenda they have got. Uh, because at the end of the day, the role of the police is to allow uh, peaceful protests to take place, to protect that from infiltration, and to also provide security uh, to others to prevent loss of lives and to prevent damage of property. But what we see is a blanket um, you know, suppression of just about everything. Uh, to the extent that uh, then what is the role of the police vis-a-vis -vis the law? Um, if they, have you noticed, that has been the refrain. Um, we know there's going to be infiltration by goons. Who are these goons that they ever arrest? Mm -hmm. Instead, what you do see is protesters being arrested, 147 in total today. Um, I understand there's reports that despite the fact that yesterday the judiciary said uh, the courts would be open, 24-7 uh, to allow uh, arraignment and, uh, you know, the processing through the justice system, um, people are still in custody tonight as we speak. So protesters are arrested, but the goons that they told us they had intelligence about that had infiltrated or had ill will are never arrested? Yeah, and, and protesters who will be set free mostly by, yeah. by the courts tomorrow because yeah. really there is absolutely no uh, strong legal ground to um, take them through. Um, you, you can't convict them for trying to assemble. Mm. Uh, you can't cite third Article 37 and at the same time arrest those who are trying to exercise that right. Yeah. Uh, what, what is really tragic is the failure by the police to evolve what we are seeing is the police turning back to 
the old ways of doing things. And um, police find it very difficult in moments like this to be impartial. And I think that's where the problem uh, lies. How else do we explain abductions? How else do we explain the fact that journalists are now targeted by uh, police? Journalists are targeted by the police for the simple reason that they are relaying the information. And I, I think we do have that um, uh, picture mm. of the particular... It's, uh, it's actually on screen now. This is it's everything screen, right? that, yeah, that had occurred with the and, and I think that point is coming where you can actually see how a policeman aggressively charges at a journalist. Yeah. And um, you wonder why this would happen um, in an environment where we keep talking of police reforms. Uh, look at that quality of aggression. I mean, there is a goon in uniform, mm. uh, nothing short of that. How about firing uh, tear gas canisters at leave alone journalists, but unarmed protesters. Mm. I mean, what level of thuggery is that? I think uh, the Maraga team, uh, uh, the former Chief Justice Maraga was working on uh, uh, some reforms. Uh, but we do have a mindset problem when it comes to the uh, Kenya police, the National Police uh, uh, Service. They remain very active uh, partisans in the political uh, problems the country is facing. They always come, not as independent arbiters, you know, they use property and protection of, and more of protection property of property than, than life, than, than life yeah. uh, when it comes to their uh, in intervention. And what really the police service should uh, realize is they are delaying uh, political maturity in this country. And well, how about we talk about the goons uh, that you earlier on highlighted and the failure by the police to arrest uh, uh, goons? Particularly, because, Linus, yes. there were those who were seen in, in Kericho, and I remember we reported that on Tuesday, there were goons who were patrolling the streets, carrying rungus and sticks, and nothing happened to them. And we've seen that as well in, uh, I believe it was Nandi Town as well, uh, and in other places in Wasangishu. I mean... It would it seem that the goons are allowed uh, the free space to congregate and do their work, but protesters are not? Now, a nonpartisan police service would not allow that because that only leads to breaking of the law. But we know, and it is a fact, that the police turn a blind eye to these organized responses to political uh, uh, situations. Can we also remember, for example, that... Um, after 25th of June, mm. the rest of the protest was infiltrated by, by, by goons. So police would talk about infiltration, but they will not table the evidence. evidence yeah. They will not provide th those uh, who, have been, uh, who have actually infiltrated. When some politicians openly went into the social media mm. threatening to occupy and attack certain entities, uh, using, of course, uh, hired goons. Police did, uh, uh, did nothing. So this is not a very good night for the police. They may consider the operation of today of keeping pro the city empty uh, quite successful. But in terms of uh, very non-partisan, independent, as they are expected, policing, they are really, really failing. The attacks on journalists, particularly today, were really, really ugly. And we can also talk about the events at uh, Jimmy Wanjigi's house. Mm. Um, they have very many legal ways of, of doing uh, what is currently going on in uh, Mr. Wanjigi's house. Uh, um, and yet there's a whole platoon um, and, and a very serious deployment uh, to his home um, for that purpose and uh, late into the night, including at this very hour. Uh, we'll be speaking to uh, Njoroge Gatete in a moment to just uh, take a look at what the situation is like there. Uh, but it's also a reminder that, you know, the police who shot at the Kameme journalist, Wanjeri, have still not been found. Exactly. Um, so it's... it's 147 protesters have today been arrested. 174. My bad. 174 arrested. Um, the police who shot at journalists, not. They're the not police who known. shoot um, at uh, protesters um, are not known. Um, you know, they're still seeking them out. 
uh, I mean, it's, it's very obvious to see uh, on which side the police is leaning, and it is not on the protection of people and uh, enforcing the law to allow people to exercise their constitutional rights. And it's an important point you raise because, um, like, you look at um, even the leaders of the young people that spoke yesterday, they were talking about they are still coming to the streets because there are key issues that they think have yet, are yet to be addressed. That the, the question of unemployment, the question of um, oppressive governance, as they called it, but also they were saying that uh, public assets are being sold. Um, so you may disagree on the that statement and what it means but of course there has been several issues that have been uh, of concern the past few weeks especially uh, with the ppp programs or arrangements that are being um, pursued by uh, the government whether it's um, with ketrak on how to build a transmission line or it's um, the expansion of the jimo kenyatta international airport where there's a, a proposal being looked at by the kenya airports authority but now when you're still looking at the first time the killings happened on the 18th of june up until now and as you say no police officer has been brought to book we've not even heard of any prosecution and the investigations that have been quite uh, slow in happening we're getting to the point that um, the police officers are deploying different strategies to ensure that the protests do not happen in the first place and it's being su successful how about deploying the same effort in investigating cases that have already been reported, families that have already reported the loss of their loved ones? And it's interesting that this protest is happening at a time that Professor Kithure Kindiki is coming back to the office because he has been making several promises, including coming up with guidelines on how um, arrests are supposed to be made. Uh, I don't know how much more work you'll have because his ministry is responsible for uh, policy and giving policy directions to the um, National Police Service. So he has a bit of work there to do and also to regain the confidence that um, Kenyans may not have had the past few weeks. Uh, but also, I, I say something about um, Article 35. I meant Article 34, which is on the freedom of the media. Article 35 is about the access to information, uh, which are crucial. Uh, in ensuring that at least Kenyans are able to uh, get to know wh wh what's going on. But then again, you look at even the road to today, and the president has been calling, had been calling for uh, Kenyans to avoid the Nane Nane protest, not to be part of it, and it's, it's, it's happening on, on such an important day. So you can see there has been a bit of work going on behind the scenes on ensuring that um, the protest should be left to June and July. And it's interesting how, uh, you know, the law is, is cited and policy and regulation is cited, um, you know, depending on, on the argument that one is trying to make. Uh, so during the vetting, uh, when Professor Kithure Kindiki was asked about, um, uh, you know, the police brutality, he was quick to remind us about the independence of the police and that that does not fall under, uh, you know, his purview as the cabinet secretary. Uh, but then again, on the events that took place on uh, the 25th of June, um, he was uh, quick to take credit that, you know, they did the work that they did that was necessary to secure the country from falling into anarchy. So at what point, really, is the CS um, in charge of the policy uh, when it comes to uh, the law and regulation? And at what point um, isn't he? When is the police independent and when is it not? Um, and, and this is what you see constantly with the protests. Um, over 60 people um, have been killed so far many others missing. Police have not been um, called to order for that. Mm -hmm. When Masharia Gaitha was um, uh, abducted inside a police station, who were those officers who bundled him into a car in a police station and drove him away? Who are they? Where are they now? What's happened to them? What's happened to the killers and, and, and those who've maimed and injured all of these others? Where are those investigations? So whilst the police are quick tonight to um, you know, claim success and they've managed to secure the country and secure the CBD, we would also like another press briefing that perhaps gives us an update on where we are um, with the investigations against uh, people, uh, you know, people have lost their lives and we don't see the same fervent press conferences. If, even though they those. might tell you that the police will not investigate themselves, it is up to the independent policing oversight authority who will then come and complain that the police, that the police service is not, not cooperating. cooperating. Mm. Yeah. Uh, because again, so like, do you see again, like, like you've been Just saying, the buck. so if there's a tear gas canister that has been used on a journalist, it came from yeah. a police officer, um, unless otherwise stated. So 
you need information who was deployed where, mm -hmm. which were the officers that were manning what area. Because if you look at the images of even those officers that were um, having some bit of a situation with journalists, all of them are wounded. You don't, yep. know, you don't know who is who. And that's what and um, everyone needs information to determine right. who, 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 who and the protesters, um, you know, Casmo said that, uh, saying any unidentified men riding on government vehicles. I don't know if we've got that, and, and we can listen uh, to that uh, now. If we see unidentified men in civilian clothing riding in government vehicles that have obfuscated qualities, we shall treat them as robbers. There you go. Every bullet, every tear gas canister is usually accounted for. It's, it's rather easy to trace and easy to find the people. It is. But one of the biggest questions I, I want us to address here on the program tonight is, um, and it'll lead us perhaps into the next uh, conversation we're having here, is, like you said, there are issues that are being raised by those who are protesting is anybody listening to that? Um, and even as we seek to answer that question or solve that problem, are we solving that problem? Are we answering the questions that are being raised uh, by you know, those out on the streets, Linus? I think there is a missed opportunity here uh, for the country because we just need to remind ourselves of how the first protests were. They were in a very unprecedented way, very peaceful. For the first time, and remember, we uh, were hearing uh, from the streets that it's not about stones, it's about phones, mobile phones. So these young protesters came to the streets of Nairobi armed with only about three things. They had mobile phones, they had national flags, and they had a bottle of water. It can't be more harmless than that. That is historic in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the history of our, of, of our protests in this country. Well, there was a joke about speaking fluent English to the police. <laughs> and uh, generally young, tribeless, mm. faceless, leaderless. That was the start. How is it ending on this day, which uh, Makaure there said was their last day in uh, uh, in, in the streets. It's ending with a very ugly picture of lack of accountability on the part of the authorities that are in charge of law and order. Because we've seen more of a political response in the manner of in the manner the militia would uh, uh, respond. The police are yet to demonstrate a big difference between how they responded and how some of those goons who infiltrated the, the, the protesters also uh, played a role, which was to disperse them uh, in a very unaccountable way, uh, cause violence, uh, damage to property and all, and all that. I think the casualty um, has been accountability because it will be very difficult, and some you pointed out correctly, uh, how difficult it's going to be for even IPOA to trace some of those basic uh, uh, questions. We're asking people who have complaints to go to uh, IPOA, and IPOA is saying they don't have access <laughs> to, uh, to, 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 to the information that they're they are looking for. So, and so begins the ugly chapter where We'll have more than 50 people killed, tens of others abducted, and no one to answer to that. And the police have been down this path before. Uh, this is, these are some of the things they did in 2017, uh, and even the election before, before that. In nearly every political contest there's been in this, in this country, there'll always be the side of the police coming in in a way that is not impartial, but also is um, unaccountable. Because you need to also remember the number of people or policemen in hoods, the number of policemen or people calling themselves policemen um, in um, unmarked vehicles. How do you, account, uh, how do you account, account for that? And how do you differentiate that from, from militia, yeah. private, hired from goons. and from goons? Right. 
the people who are shooting uh, protesters in parliament, some of them were not in uniform. Who are these? And these are some of the questions that will not die down. These are some of the questions that will like baby Pendo's killing will continue to come up from time to time, from time to time until accountability is uh, achieved. And by the way, in the Pendo's uh, account, uh, an inquest by, uh, by by the court actually produced uh, some results, and uh, yeah, they are police now going to yeah, yes yeah facing facing yeah. Uh, prosecution for that. And that's right. Uh, you know, just a quick one on uh, accountability that uh, you've mentioned. Um, you know, the former Inspector General of Police, uh, you know, resigned. Tafet Kome. Where's the accountability around everything that happened under his tenure? You know, he just resigns and and goes away. So who gets to ask the questions? Now we've got, you see, that's how we sweep things under the rug and, and, and seemingly move on. Actually, the, the, there was a, an, an entire change at the yes. leadership of the National Police Service. Right now, I think we're just about to hear of the vetting of uh, Douglas Kanja, mm. who has been nominated to be IG. the Inspector General. Yeah. But I recall when he, when he spoke to the now newly appointed cabinet secretary for interior Kithire Kindiki here he said that police officers do not become police officers when they wear their uniform they are police officers even before then but while that is true they need to be identified mm. you cannot deal with people that are unidentified because imagine the, even the image that you're seeing on your screen what if some of those um, pretending to be journalists are police officers what are we supposed to do that is why it is important that they are in full uniform, um, mm. whatever. Identifiable, yeah. Uh, exactly, identifiable uniform, mm. so that it becomes easy for everyone. Uh, and also, when it comes to the question you're asking about accountability, there are reports of people that shot at people dressed differently. So even if the family is complaining, it, it becomes very easy for uh, the institution, that is the police service, to say we do not know who that was. And we have heard it, that you are told the CCTV footage could not clearly identify mm. who the person mm. uh, that killed Rex was. How then do you give justice? Because there's been a promise. And if you recall that even the past few weeks, we've been hearing of um, communication from different institutions, from the embassies in the country, yeah. uh, from the U.S. There was an official that was in the country, is it yesterday? Mm -hmm. And they are still insisting on that, the freedom of expression, that people need to be given an opportunity to, uh, to express themselves in those demonstrations, but at the same time taking responsibility where it is required, so that in the end, we are a country that is governed by the rule of law. Sure. That should not just be yeah. something that people love to talk about yeah. in speeches or when they are promising to ascend into office, but something that needs to be practiced. Mm. The past few uh, weeks, we've not had a cabinet secretary for interior. Well, Musala Mudavad has been acting in all the other institutions. We've not had CSS who would sit in the National Security Council. But the, security, the National Security Council, I would imagine, had the president, mm. the deputy president himself, the chief of defense forces, General Kahari, uh, the, probably the acting inspector general, in this case, is it Gabriel? Yes. Um, so maybe they were still having sessions. The director general of the National Intelligence Service was still in office, mm -hmm. Nuruddin Haji, mm -hmm. but, uh, and also the uh, National Advisor on Security Matters, who is the secretary to that National Security Council. But in the absence of the cabinet secretaries who have now come in, what might be the decisions that the National Security Council made that probably would have resulted in what you're seeing today? Because in as much as the National Police Service is independent, there could be certain instructions coming from the National Security Council. Right. And the chairperson of that is the president. So how do you distinguish that? In as much as the cabinet secretary, um, Kindiki, says... His is just on policy directions because he's the only person who can direct the police and the director of public prosecutions in the specific mm -hmm. case of investigations. But there appears to be a sort of a relationship that may emerge in the National Security Council as the national security organs that could actually trickle down and you find that some of the wishes of the political class are seen on the streets. Yeah, and uh, that's uh, the next question then. Um, the protesters have been calling for good governance. The response we've seen is rather a political one. You know, it's, it's sort of like in an exam when you, you answer the next question. 
what's happening with that response? Because now we're seeing the political class saying, okay, give him time, all right, uh, broad-based and, and, and that sort of thing. But is that political response commensurate to the questions that are being raised by the protesters? Like, is it the right answer? Well, I think the lack of structure on the side of protesters actually left this debate open-ended, free for the interpretation of the president and uh, the people that the grievances were being directed at to interpret it and proceed as they wished. Because remember, initially, the demands were posted online. And, uh, and even just before that, there was the code of conduct. Remember, a very good code of conduct that guided how the protests uh, should be uh, uh, carried out. And the initial demand was, we reject the finance bill in totality reject that completely. Now, that was at least clear, and that was given. It was to the government actually uh, gave up, and the, and the finance bill was uh, withdrawn. And then after that, the next series of uh, protests now shifted the demand to uh, Ruto must go, to which, again, the pressure on government led to the dissolution of, of the cabinet. Yeah. Now, from there, there was a lot of silence from the side of uh, uh, protesters. And um, what we ended up having is, uh, I, I know we sat here trying to predict what we thought would be a very thorough public vetting of the cabinet complete with the Excel sheets ab <laughs> about each and every uh, uh, nominee. That did not happen. And this goes down to the, what I can only call the lack of a particular structure in terms of what the protesters also uh, wanted done. Uh, in, 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 in events like this, and, and we've seen them in, in, in other places, the demands are normally very clear that we reject this and do this instead. Was there any guideline as to what cabinet should be constituted after the first one was dissolved? I don't remember to best of my, my, my recollection. So President um, Ruto comes up with a formula called broad-based. Now, some would have thought that broad-based would really be sectoral. You know, you're thinking of uh, people coming from the anti-corruption space, civil society, uh, broad-based private sector. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes, private sector. You know, broad-based uh, in that sense. <laughs> uh, the broad-based ended up being a UDA ODM uh, alliance, uh, basi basically. And uh, when broad-based was tabled by President Ruto, were there any demands from the side of protesters? on what that broad-based uh, should look like. I think there are also missed opportunities on the part of the protesters on what they really wanted uh, fulfilled. Because some sat here and uh, you know, we spoke to a number of Gen Zs uh, on, on this set uh, in terms of what then should happen if the demand is the government resigns. What, sh what, what, what should happen? And um, that lack of a clear end game um, could well be the reason also that we got the cabinet that was sworn in today uh, because what else was there as an alternative? And I think that's, that's the gap, the one gap that uh, uh, protest organizers also uh, left and that basically gave a clean slate for uh, the president and his team to go as they wished. And we will come back and talk about what uh, that broad-based uh, government looks like because that broad-based government became official today, this morning, when uh, the cabinet members were sworn in by the president at State House. So we'll be taking a look at uh, that new cabinet and the way forward. This is News Gang. We'll be right back.